Welcome to today's episode of Women's View. I'm your host, Anne Moremi, and it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Um, I have with me in studio a very distinguished and uh, pleasant lady, and we're going to be talking about dysfunctional family patterns. Welcome and enjoy the show. So uh, I'd like to invite our guest to introduce herself, Tari Busana. Thank you so much. My name is Jane Maragua Kuria, and it's such a joy to be here. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. One of the things that you did not say, which I'm very happy to say, is that you're joining us all the way from California in the US. <laughs> and uh, I'm excited about that because one of the advantages of uh, this whole pandemic has been just the high uptake of uh, you know, uh, apps and uh, solutions like Zoom, which is what we're currently using. So I'm so grateful to be able to be having this conversation with you despite the geographical distance. So yeah, thank you yeah. so much for, for, yeah. for making the time. There's a time difference, but it doesn't matter. We've been able to synchronize. So welcome so much to GBS. You've been, you've been on GBS TV before. And yes. Just to tell the viewers that uh, in case you're on uh, social media, remember the handle to use is GBS TV Africa for all the social media channels. And if you want to send us a message, the number to, the number to use is 21144. So welcome. So Jane, you know, I'm happy that in your introduction, you've talked about the fact that you have studied psychology for your master's degree. And before that you did education. And already I can see that you're a very interesting person who is able to change careers. So my first question to you is, did you ever like, work in a school did you make use of your first degree which was in education i did i did um but not for so long um when i i graduated um for my bachelor's um in 2004 i finished my um bachelor's in uh april i believe of 2004 and then we came to the us with my husband in 2004, October. So immediately, I didn't even attend my graduation ceremony. So I came here, you know, I'm glad that I was already done with school. I just went back to get my, my certificate. But when I came here to the US, that's when I was able to do uh, some teaching in high school. Um, but at the time, I was also raising our young children. We have three boys, 16, 15, and 11. And therefore, I did not do a lot of full-time teaching. I only did part-time so I can be able to take care of the boys while my husband was working full-time. So yes, I have taught, but um, my focus mostly was raising kids. And that's when after raising them and doing all that, and I decided it's time for me to go back to school and, um, you know, do what I love. And All do right. my life. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That, that is such a good introduction to yourself because in that, uh, uh, basically in your answer, I've learned a lot about you and I've been able to figure out that you're a family person, you're a mom, you've got three boys, kudos to that. No wonder you look so good because boys have so much energy. <laughs> <laughs> They do. They You're keep right. Running around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they keep you busy. They keep you busy. So brings me to another question for you is when you decided to go back to, to the workspace and to go back to school, what is it that inspired you to go into psychology for your master's and very specific marriage and family psych uh, psychology? That's a very good question. Um, I actually, which is a very interesting thing, um, I figured out that I wanted to be a therapist when I was seven years old. The reason was, um, you know, it's growing up and observing a lot, maybe in your own family and uh, you know, environments, in other families as well. I noticed a lot of sadness 
in marriages and families. And I used to be bothered a lot by that. And I used to say, hmm, when people get married, are they supposed to be sad all the time? You know, should they be crying and they are not able to solve their conflicts? And I was really bothered. I was only seven. And of course, I also saw maybe how even in school we were being treated. There was a lot of beating and all that stuff. And it kept bothering me. And I was like, what's the better way of people relating with one another, especially in the family unit? How can there be problems, but they are able to deal with them without feeling like you're stuck, you're sad, you're depressed or always angry. There's always something to complain about. There's a lot of chaos. So what can we do to solve that problem? So I decided it's time for me to go back to what I really wanted to do and be able to really go to the families and help them deal with those issues as they come because they always will. But the, the big question is how do you handle those differences? Wow, that is such a nice answer. And there's a bit of a surprise in your answer. The fact that you discovered this when you were seven years old. You know, a lot of times we tend to think that as parents, we're able to hide a lot from our children. But it is very, very interesting that you're able to say that when you were seven, you were able to to see that there was a lot of sadness in families and in marriages. And, And that is very interesting because it means that children are able to be perceptive. And that as much as sometimes you try to hide things from children, they are able to see through the, to see through, what would I call it? The, like the fakeness, they're able to perceive that there's something going on here. And I'm also very happy to know that, uh, you know, you were able to figure out what you wanted to be very early and kudos to you because that is something that takes people a lifetime to figure. So I'm happy that you're able to figure it out when you were so young and Many years later, you were able to step into it and uh, already you are actually practicing in California. So I'm, I'm so grateful because, you know, when I when I listen to you, when I talk to you, I can be able to see somebody who has actually been able to 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 thrive and to walk into what you wanted. You know, like you're living the life you wanted to when you were little. That is awesome, you know, and mm. well done for that. Thank so, you. Uh, uh, so today's topic, dysfunctional family patterns you know uh a lot of one of the reasons why i i i wanted to interview you is because i saw you on social media and you were talking about how you've packed your bags a couple of times (laughs) (laughs) and uh as somebody who is married i can relate to that and a lot of my viewers can relate to that so Tell us a little bit about your experience, you know, like how long you've been married and uh, how the journey has been. And maybe one or one, one or one time or two times when you wanted to pack your bags and what made you stop? Well, not that I wanted, I actually did. So, (laughs) um, well, you know, this is the interesting part. And this is where most of us could really connect to this because, some of the things we observe in our own families or maybe elsewhere growing up, we always say, I am not going to do that. I am not going to do that to my family, to my kids and blah, blah, blah. But then when you find yourself in that situation where you're married, you start repeating some of those patterns you saw growing up. You know, you're not able to resolve conflicts. You don't even know how to communicate. You don't know how to express your needs. And you feel like, wow, I can't believe the very things I was saying I would never do. I'm actually doing them because you don't know any better. You are never taught how to actually communicate your needs and say what you want. You were told to Nyamaza, you know, there was a lot of Nyamaza or you're being beaten and you're being told to be quiet. Can you imagine you're feeling pain? You're crying and you're told, don't cry or else I'll beat you again. And you suppress the pain. You suppress the pain. You don't know how to really express yourself. So for me, it was also the struggle with how I'm feeling inside 
the the because the feelings of maybe feeling like I'm not being validated, accepted, um, treated well, all those things. I was suppressing them. Every time something would come, I was I didn't know how to say it in a nice way. So I would keep it to myself. And then when it got too overwhelming, it's like I would blow up and I would just now start packing my things and go because it's like, wow, it's not safe here. I was getting married thinking that this would be a safe space for me. He promised to always be there for me, to love me till death do us part and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, wait a minute, where is this love that I was promised? And I'm feeling hurt. You know, it's like a cycle is repeating itself. But what I learned is that I didn't know how to really express myself and say how I actually felt and what I wanted and how maybe whatever was done to me was frustrating me. Because one of those things for me was the if someone's tone of voice was off or it made me feel uncomfortable, I would just shut down completely. completely. And I didn't know, like, how to say it. I was triggered and it would take me back to my growing up where in schools we were being shouted at, at home maybe shouted at, and his the tone of voice was one of my really breaking moments for me. So I would pack my bags because I'm keeping them feelings inside and packing my bags was a way of protesting and maybe trying to express how I'm feeling. But then I realized, ooh, it's not solving anything. I keep making these threats, packing my bags and leaving and maybe unpacking them and staying. And, you know, it wasn't healthy. So I was like, wow, what am I supposed to do? What am I, how am I supposed to even say I didn't appreciate maybe the way you spoke to me, you know? And then I had to learn, I had to learn to teach myself to talk to a therapist, to talk to a trusted friend or person. And I was able to really learn to communicate. And of course, part of my training also was really helpful. So I I got it. I got it. I say, you know, and that's what we most of us struggle with. We don't know how to express. We don't. Because we were always being told to shut up, shut up, shut up. Every time, especially in dysfunctional families, there's no room for mistakes. There's no room for even saying, I'm feeling sad. Or um, you don't even know how you feel anymore because if you feel, you get in trouble. So you have to suppress. Yeah. And you know what? As you're talking, I can really relate to that because a lot of us would always say, I mean, it's like children are not to be, they're not to be hard. To be hard, it's to be seen. Not yeah. to be hard, they're to be seen. And therefore, you we ended up like a generation of people who actually had a disability when it came to expressing ourselves. You could be feeling a lot of things, but you're not saying, and you don't even know how to articulate. And so in a way, I do, I do agree with, with what you're saying that it is so important and and some of the take home for me is that even as i'm raising my children i need to to give them a chance to articulate their feelings to articulate yep. their emotions so that they're mm -hmm. able to to look within themselves and say i'm feeling this 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 name it mm -hmm. because of this 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 and the solution is this 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 mm -hmm. you know that mm -hmm. is actually a life skill because what i've come to realize is that in a lot of uh human adult interactions, that does not happen. People mm. are not able to say what, to, to be honest about what they are feeling and what they're going through. And what mm. happens is that therefore, uh, by the time you, you, feel, you, feel, you feel that, you, you're doing it with a lot of anger. And then the other person already uh, feels bad because they're like, now why are you shouting at me? Because I can imagine those times you pack your bag how would your husband respond, for example? Mm. Well, it was frustrating, definitely, for him as well, because um, it's like, whoa. You know, first of all, he didn't even know his, his, tone, his tone of voice was off. So it's like, whoa, you know, like, what's wrong? Like, what's the, why didn't you tell me? You know, it's like, how, I, you know, he can't read my mind. He can't. Can I have to say it for him to know that this is what's happening? And um, you know, thank God he's he's really he said sorry. <laughs> you know, he would say sorry. It's like I never knew that I 
my my voice was off or my tone. You know, you should have told me. And, you know, I, I would appreciate if you really say it because sometimes I don't even realize it. You know, and sometimes he does, you know, he would realize it and he would say, oh, yeah, I, I think I'm sorry. My voice was off. My tone of voice was off. So, you know, it, it's a matter of, and of course, what I'm saying is sometimes the other person may not respond in the way you want. Maybe you might tell them that their tone of voice was off and they might start telling you, of course, now it's like gaslighting, but, oh, you're overreacting, you're too sensitive, you know, you're always talking about tone of voice, what's wrong with you? You take it or leave it. Now, there is a problem right there. So... You, you have to be very consistent when you're talking about these issues because they may say that to push you away so that you can leave them alone. So they also don't have to face their own struggles with maybe how they express their, themselves and even their anger issues. So they may say that to just tell you, shut up, you know, I... I I don't care how you feel because they also, you know, of course, even men, they were taught not to cry. They were told, told a man is has to be strong. They have to behave a certain way. You don't show your weakness and blah, blah, blah. So some may think that accepting or saying that, yes, you're right, my tone was off and I'm sorry, I will do better next time. They may see that as a weakness. So they have to keep obeying their ego so that they can continue to feel good as a man, which honestly, it's a fallacy. You know, it's not true. It does not show that you're man enough when you're rude or you're disrespectful to a woman. So, you know, it's a learning lesson for both genders, for both people, whoever is in a relationship. Also, be willing to listen to the other person and hear what they're saying and just be empathize, you know, empathize with them validate them and say, you know, if that's how you felt, I'm sorry. Because it doesn't matter because those are your feelings and they're valid, whether the other person thinks they're not. You know, it, they're yours. They, they're valid regardless of what the other person thinks. So just knowing that, yes, it's a team, it's your unit, you love each other, you care for each other, and it takes a lot of unlearning, especially based on how we were raised as children and all the things we were told a man should or a woman should do. You know, there was a lot that was dictated for us growing up. So you have to find your own way of handling uh, your marriage and maybe how you communicate, how you resolve your conflict. How you validate one another because so many of us enter in relationship really wanting validation and acceptance because you didn't get any of that probably in your own family so it's very important to understand that wounding that happens in our younger years so that even as you get together because you're both wounded in your own way be empathetic and just support one another in that healing process because Wounding happens in relationships and healing also happens in relationships. So relationships can be very healing as well. So it's important to be open-minded and be there to support one another in your own journey, individually and together. So when I listen to you, Jane, basically you're saying that, uh, and uh, I always like to use personal example, and I'm happy that you don't mind because you actually use your own example. So you're basically saying that for example, your husband's tone of voice, uh, basically you learned not to relate it to your childhood experience. Yep, because the tone of voice was a trigger. It was a trigger. It used to trigger you to remember what used to happen in your family that used to make you feel insecure and sad. Mm -hmm. And it's like you were associating his tone of voice to mm -hmm. whatever in your family. Mm -hmm. Which was a wrong association. So, so that brings me to the next uh, question. I mean, does that mean that you should accept that tone of voice? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> because I'm like very I mean, good one. Is that, is that a free pass for for like bad behavior? Because <laughs> what? Would all bad behavior be acceptable because you basically you 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 shouldn't let anything be a trigger for you, you know what I mean? 
one thing I I I love your question and that that's a very good one. So the thing is you don't really allow people to walk all over you and you they get away with it. First of all, a trigger makes you react to something in such a strong magnitude that is not sometimes even warranted. Maybe it's something that he just says and it's not. So instead of me really just saying, whoa, you know, I, I, you know, I, the tone of voice, I, I don't know, why, why did you talk like that? You know, the tone of voice was not really, I, that made me uncomfortable. So I don't say that because I'm being triggered and taken back many years ago. I actually react by maybe completely shutting down. I don't even say anything. I shut down and then it's like, whoa, packing my bags. That is extreme, right? It's really extreme. One thing I know is that in any relationship, there will be moments where someone might say something that you don't like, you know? Let's accept the humanness in each one of us because I also have moments when I was doing things that were really unacceptable to him and he would make him angry, right? Or uncomfortable or that. Because we are both humans, we are bound to make mistakes. And the thing is, how do you address those issues when they come? Because they always will. When you're driven by something that someone does, it takes you, you actually overreact. You give it such a strong weight, which sometimes is not even worth what was done so it's like someone has has said something and then you're giving them such a harsh punishment for it so because i didn't know how to communicate my needs and express my feelings that's why i was overreacting sometimes but the thing is it does not mean that i just keep quiet and i don't say anything about it now the 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 what is very important is just how I undress it. Am I undressing it from a space of feeling like a seven-year-old and I'm just shouting at him and just trying to bring, you know, try to use him to heal that child in me? Or am I just talking to him and just saying, you know what? Wow, that that felt that made me feel really uncomfortable. Can you help me understand maybe why you really raised your voice like that. And maybe we can now engage in a discussion or a conversation, an open conversation where we can understand each other. But when I talk of triggers and me feeling like a seven year old, it's like, whoa, what's wrong with you? Why did you do that to me? Oh, I'm living, this is un un unacceptable. You're, you're such a horrible person, I'm living. That is off, that is off. So you, we, have to, we have to know the difference. Yeah, I can hear you very loud and clear, Jen. And, and one of the words that you keep using is trigger. And trigger has just made me think about, about tantrums. Because, you know, when you're a parent, you have those moments when you do something to your child and your child throws a tantrum. You know, like you could be in a supermarket and they want crisps and you say no and they throw themselves on the ground and you look at, you look at them and you're like, okay, this is a tantrum. And I feel like as adults, we can get we, we can be having tantrums and maybe I think that's what you're calling triggers. Mm -hmm. So basically I think as a person you have to reach that point where you look at yourself and ask yourself, my response to this situation was mm -hmm. it was it normal? Was it an underreaction or was it an overreaction? I think mm -hmm. and you know to be honest, Jane, that, that takes a high level of maturity. Which is not, it's not a common thing to be mature. I've come to realize as an adult, mm. maturity is, is very high level, but it is definitely something that we aspire to, to mm. get to. And uh, I hear you that we, you need to look at yourself and, and see how you're responding. And sometimes another thing that I want to ask is, uh, you know, uh, when you're mm. afraid to, mm. to accept the dysfunctionality in your family, Mm. Does it mean you're not ready to deal? I'm sorry, say that again. When you're, when you're, I'll, I'll, sometimes people don't want to accept. They don't want mm -hmm. to go there. They don't want to accept that there was mm. a dysfunctionality in their family. Mm. Mm. And they keep avoiding. Mm. Mm. 
is there something that you can do in that case or or should you just wait for somebody to reach the point they are ready to deal with it healing is very personal it's so personal and that's why you can you can show you can you can you can guide someone to the right direction but it's up to them to really take that direction if they want so healing is super personal and it's a very intentional journey if someone is not ready to heal or take it you have to leave them at where they are until they're ready what is so so important is for you as an individual because sometimes we tend to really tell people what to do and how to fix themselves while we actually also have a long way to go to also heal ourselves so it's important to fast learn because if they want to remain in their space of woundedness and be stuck in that space of self protection because it's basically self protection it's that child little child trying to protect themselves by putting this mask you know or shield around themselves and they use anger to protect themselves it's like whoa you you getting angry and telling this person keep off me so anger is a self protection strategy so as as a person let's say you have a family member who is always angry they never listen whatever you know they always have their own skin going on the thing is you have to learn now you have to think of what is within my control and what is not within my control within your control is how you react to their anger when they get angry because their anger is their own self protection so for you when they get angry do you get in the mud hole with them do you get in that space of you start exchanging words with them and you going back and forth disrespecting each other or do you see them in that moment where they get angry and you're like you know what this is not mine too control it is less to control all i can do is how i respond to how they talk to me you can either walk away you can either respectfully say you know what i really don't appreciate how you're talking to me right now i'm just going to go and i'm not going to engage you i'll only engage you when you're ready to talk to me in a respectful manner and walk away so this is now you being in that space of healing where you are not letting yourself get in that mud hole with them because you have learned that yes you come home all the time you get angry you start insulting everybody you know what i'm not going to give you that space anymore i'm not going to allow myself to always be angry and always be sad because of your behavior that is yours keep it whenever you're ready to heal you will but for me i'm on this journey sometimes it's cutting off completely even with family members it's okay it's okay to say you know what the more i remain in this space trying to make things work the other person is not willing to do their part you have to love yourself too much to walk away from a situation that continues to make you sad angry and you're always feeling so small and it's like in their presence there's some energy being taken out of you and you feel like you're so drained all the time so you have to separate yourself from even situations and people who continue to make you feel small and worthless and all these other you know things so it's really it takes a lot of maturity and this is where when you heal that little child you don't have to keep calling it at the name you know all kinds of stuff and sometimes it's even to do with parents who are also wounded in their own way who haven't really healed themselves and when you heal yourself then you're able to look at your parents as wounded as they are and be able to accept them as they are be able to tell yourself you know what my dad gets super angry he's so mean but you know when he gets to that space i'm just going to walk away when he's come and he's ready to talk to me i will engage him so you're able to really really separate what is within my control what is not and that gives you a lot of peace yeah that is so so good to hear right now you know just that issue of what you can control and what you can't control because a lot of times what really interferes with our situations is when you're trying to control the things that you cannot control and mm-hmm. that results in a lot of frustration and a lot mm. of anger and a mm. lot of uh, a lot of issues and i like mm. what you said because you're mm. basically saying that 
it is okay to walk away. And mm-hmm. so my next question is, mm-hmm. uh, does that mean, for example, let's talk a little bit about separation and divorce. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because a marriage, uh, it's mm-hmm. one of the, the, the things that can happen in marriages. Can you mm-hmm. get to the point where you are, you're healed and you're impatient with the healing of your spouse to the point you're just like, you know what, uh, let me just walk away because you're taking so long to heal and I'm not in a capacity to mm. give you more time because as I'm mm. giving you more time, mm. it's a bit of a loss of time on my part in terms of relating mm. with a, a healed and a whole person. What mm. would you say to that? Well, it, it really also depends on each individual because this is a very personal decision that someone has to make. But mm. the, the good thing about taking that journey yourself and hopefully maybe the spouse will be willing to come along and do the journey together. That would be wonderful. But the thing is, if they are not ready, because one of the issues that I hear a lot from women is the, the infidelity part, you know, where this person has been uh, having multiple, multiple women and um, you they've been caught you see text, you see this, you see that. And it could be a man or a woman who is cheating. But, you, you you know, what I've heard from women, you know, unfortunately, most men don't really reach out for help. And that's the, you know, also the socializing part where men were told you have to be strong, you don't show weaknesses. And they really, hopefully, they can continue to reach out for help because they also need that. Um Women who come to me, they say, oh, Jane, I have developed high blood pressure. Oh, I am struggling with, um, you know, migraines and all these other physical ailments as a result of the spouse being, you know, cheating and being with so many women. And I tell them, you know, you have to now think about if you have tried to address this issue and they seem to not really care about it, you have to ask yourself, are you willing to honor yourself sometimes and walk away? Because what are the, you're saying you're staying for the sake of children. And like I shared earlier, I knew there was a problem when I was seven. So you, you, you're you not really staying for the kids. You're telling kids that it's okay even when you become my age and you get married. It's okay to tolerate an abusive relationship. It's okay to be in a toxic relationship. It's okay to develop high blood pressure while you're trying to save a relationship. You know, that's the message you're communicating to them. You're actually not staying for the sake of kids. You're actually trying to self-protect yourself by staying. Because you staying is a way of saying, you know, you don't honor yourself enough to really walk away from a situation that is harmful for your health. Because mm-hmm. if this is person continues to do what they're doing, you're not okay with it, and you continue to stay in that environment, that means mm-hmm. you're not ready to really honor yourself and take mm-hmm. that bold step, however scary sometimes it is. Because, yes, it's not easy. And, you know, that's why it's a very personal journey. And once you get to that space of just realizing that you're enough, you're worthy, you don't need a man or a woman to feel complete. You're already complete. You're already complete. God has created you complete. You work, you boost your self-esteem and self-worth. You will realize that, whoa, this does not align with who I am at the core. This is actually putting me in a space of betraying myself. And because of the journey that I've taken of healing and healing back in a child, I'm not that child anymore trying to protect herself. I am safe. I can make decisions that are really, really favorable to me and that decisions that will protect me. So yes, it's okay. If they're not ready to heal, whenever they are ready, they will. But probably you'll be way, way gone and you're just going to wish them well and just let them take care of themselves. It really is a very personal journey. And everyone who takes it, chances are they're not going to stay in a toxic relationship in the name of self-protection. Because that's not self-protection. That is abandoning yourself. Yeah. And you know what? Um, I'm so happy to hear you say that. You've got to get to the point where you protect yourself. Like... You can't be the one abusing yourself or keeping yourself in a situation which is abusive, especially when you know 
and you know and you're aware of it you've come to terms with it and i i don't even feel like i should add anything else to what you've said because you said so perfectly you know i have nothing to add but one thing is time is really running and i want you to tell us a little bit about your class you know the class that is going to be starting soon tell us a little bit about who should come to that class and when they come what should be their expectations and uh is it online also, or is it just a physical class? So that in case there's a viewer who is watching, they can be able to decide whether to join and or not. Mm, mm. The class is actually almost full, so I really have very few spots. So if whoever is interested can join. This is a class of people who grew up in a dysfunctional family. And uh, they are now in that space where they really, really, they are very, very intentional about getting themselves and getting in touch with who they are. It's about, you know, getting to that space. We're going to be talking more about, let's, let's go back to the roots, to the, to the foundation of how you were brought up. We're going to talk about, you know, that environment, how it was like, how did you feel, what are some of the things you observed. What are some of the things you still remember? Because whatever you can remember, it's still very, very important. Because if you can still remember it, it's significant. So we're going to talk about those things. And we're going to now move from now being aware of how that background shaped you to now coming to the space where what now? Now that I, I know this information, it's right here from, you move it from the subconscious to the conscious because we operate from a space of unconscious all the time, subconscious. So once it's on your face, you know, this is what I got, this is what I know. I neglected myself, I've abandoned myself. I don't know how to express my feelings. I allow people to walk all over me. I'm a people pleaser. I'm always telling, I'm always rescuing people because I am trying to protect myself by rescuing others because I don't know how to rescue myself. So we're gonna, you know, once the information is here on your face, then it's like, what steps can you take to now move from this survival mode to knowing that you're safe, you're safe in your environment, that you're okay and you're going to be fine. So we're going to talk about those things in details so that even as you go out there, you'll be able to notice your triggers. You'll be able to notice your patterns. And then as you notice these cycles, then you're able to break them. It is not a uh, journey that happens overnight, but then you're not operating from a space of darkness or of, of feeling threat or feeling like, whoa, I have... I'm still in my Saimara being chased by a lion. It's like, whoa, you, you're going to pause and know, oh, no, there's no lion. Okay, what can I do now? Breathe, you know, slow it down before you react. So let's see what we can do here, you know. And then, you know, you, you're you going to now live life knowing that, yes, I'm safe, I'm okay, I'm going to be fine. Yeah, and you know, that's such a good place to be at, a place where you feel safe, a place where you're happy, a place where you feel relaxed, and a, not, not a place, it's not good to go through life on that uh, flight mode, on that fear mode, because it, it takes a toll even on your physical health and on your mental health, so yeah. I'm so excited to hear that you have a solution that you're offering, and uh, okay, yeah, is it online? Or oh yeah, in California. Are we gonna have to fly over there? Or? <laughs> it's actually <laughs> online. We're gonna do it on Zoom. It's on Saturdays. We're gonna start on the eighth. Um, in the Saturday evenings, your time. It's gonna be Saturday morning, my time. And um, we're gonna do like an hour and a half for five good sessions. And, um, you know, it's going to be a very interesting journey and I'm really looking forward to it because I've noticed there's a big need for it. I really have just been loving to write because I love to write because it's part of my, you know, journey of just trying to express myself and what is in me and then I put it in writing and then I share it with the world. So, and I've seen people respond to it in a very positive way and that really and parents need to keep doing it. But now I want to now start introducing like practical ways of Rao, really going to the specifics and an individual having that interaction with me. And then we can we can see how we can grow and learn and heal together because there's a lot of healing to do. It's lifetime 
things that continue to come up in our life, you know, because it's not, you know, there'll always be issues coming up here and there. The big question is when they come, now how do we address them without feeling like we are, we are, we are not safe? Like how can we address them safely without reacting to everything that is our way? All right. And I'm so glad that that you're going to be giving this solution to, to Kenyans because, you know, as much as you live in the U.S., you are Kenyan. And now my next question, and which is probably going to be the last question, is, um, you know, how is the uptake? You know, a lot of times we feel that in Kenya, people have been a bit hesitant to, 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 to go into therapy, to have a life coach and things like that. It is changing. But, you know, compared to the U.S. and Kenya, do you feel that, are, are the people in your class mostly Kenyans or are they mostly Americans? And what can be done so that the uptake of this um, psychological solutions can be not stigmatizing? Because in Kenya, it's like when you tell someone you're seeing a therapist, for example, they, they're like, oh my God, are you about to die or something? You know what I mean? Yeah. Are we making any They call him Wazimu. Eh, mental health issues. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's not just Kenyan, by the way. Therapy, um, even here in the U.S., this, we still have a long way to go, but uh, it's probably a bit more accepted than in Kenya. Uh, for me, I tell myself, whatever smallest difference I can make to help people understand the importance of taking care of their mental health, that's what I'm do. Like, what I do is, like, you see that post I put on the African leading ladies, and I'm so glad the admin approved it is because I want to normalize, you know, and I use my personal examples deliberately because I know people will connect with that and really people did reach out. My goodness, I was overwhelmed. Some I haven't even responded back because a lot. But the thing is, you know, I want people to relate and understand and I want to normalize getting help. And I tell people I have my own therapist. I still do even now as we talk. So it is needed because there are certain things I want to be able to talk to somebody and just, you know, at the safety of a, you know, um, of a therapeutic environment where, wow, you know, I can, I can, nobody can say they don't have things that bother them once in a while. Nobody. We all, even the president, they have advisors, you know, they have people who, who help them. Whatever, you know, even even our leaders, everybody, even our even our kids, they need us as parents as their helpers and their leaders and people to guide them. So I like to make my own small difference by first sharing my story, helping people understand why it's important, you know, normalizing it by saying, I am doing it. You can do it too. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with you for wanting to get help. Because that's something we were told is not okay in our childhood. So we normalize it the way we are even talking about it right now. And this is also part of sensitizing the people in our community here and U.S. and everywhere to really Mm -hmm. take care of their mental health. And I have clients from, um, you know, the people I coach, it's some uh, those who signed up for the coaching class. Some are, some are here in the U.S., some are in Kenya. And, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. These issues are so universal. It's unbelievable. You know, maybe that's a topic for another day when I came to the U.S., the culture shock, you know, the impression we had about U.S. and whites and all that stuff. It's like, you know, they don't struggle. They have it all together, you know, all these, these things. And then you come and you interact with them, you know, in a very personal level and you realize, whoa, you're just like me. Whoa. There's a lot of commonalities here, and the only difference is their skin color. We are all humans, you know. Our blood is red. We can, you know, a black person can give a white person uh, uh, an, an an organ. You can don you can donate organ. You can. I mean, oh my gosh, it's just the skin color. We are humans, all of us. So it just tells you that. We are all humans. We are going through a human experience. Sometimes we're going to deal with it really well. Sometimes maybe not so well. We might need someone to hold our hand and help us through. And that's okay. And that's okay. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to this class. Wow. I'm so, I'm also looking forward to it. 
<laughs> so let's talk a little the last 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 thing is um a lot of times there's this view that coaching therapy is uh is classes because sometimes getting help is very expensive so is your class is it a class that is affordable or is it a class that is a little bit expensive you know it is affordable but there's one thing i also want to bring up and if we could allow me to say it in a minute or two there's something that i want people to understand and yes cost can be discouraging maybe someone cannot afford but i remember i did uh, my practicum in kenyatta national hospital because i was in kenya for three years actually a few years ago because i brought my kids to learn our culture and learn so healing so i was there for three years and i was in kenyatta for quite some time in the department of mental health i did my practicum there and there's something i observed that was very interesting you find that some parents who are coming there with their kids you know they are not from very well you know they were struggling financially you know in one way or the other and they would come with these big files with x-rays and stuff and they had spent a lot of money trying to get help for their children but then after all the x-rays and ct scans and everything the doctors would eventually realize this is a psychological problem right it's not but it's manifesting physically and they would yes. come and they have spent a lot of money yes. doing all those tests and everything else and they had to get the money because you have to pay for those services right but now when you come to the mental health section it's like now it becomes harder to afford the money so my question is we have to shift this mentality that you can easily go for those bland work and all that and you're willing to do everything in your power to get the money for those tests but when it comes to mental health services it's like whoa this is a by the way this is not as important maybe i should be work as hard to invest in it because the thing is it's it you can find free services but most of the time maybe they're not so free but the mentality that it's expensive and maybe i need it to be given to me for free then it sometimes keep people stuck and not really see the importance of this and why it's important to invest in it because look with all those other uh, services they were getting with exley they they had to do everything to raise the money but now yeah. back to your drop to the mental health because this child has been going has been watching the parents go through a lot of trauma you know they've been traumatized by all the conflicts in the family and this child now is really the psychological problems are manifesting as physical so you're taking them to the doctor but the doctor says i can't find anything so to so the psychological part of it so take it seriously get help whatever you have to do do it if you're able to get free services well and good go for it you know if you're able to if you're told it is necessary do everything in your power to get the money and take do do the work because at the end of the day if you don't treat them they're going to become catastrophic and it's going to cost you way more because some people get end up being admitted to the hospital some end up really getting into really deep deep depressive um deep you know depressive symptoms some you know die and it's serious it's serious yeah. some get stroke heart attacks and some of them are psychological in nature so please take your health seriously whether it's physical or mental don't separate the two they are equally important and even your you know self care spiritual health everything it's holistic so let's 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 take every portion of it seriously because it all matters that's what i would say but i offer you know sometimes i do pro bono i help some you know i i mentor some people here and there and i'm happy to do it i'm still doing it now but i can't afford to mentor so many so at some point therapists coaches uh psychologists psychiatrists they're trained they go through all these they also need to invest their time on people so they need to be rewarded for it so don't look at paying as a as something that is off just do it if you value yourself and you want to honor your body so that's what i would say wow 
Thank you, Jane. That was such a good answer. And uh, I really don't even want to add to it because you're right that if you don't take care of the inner you, basically you're harming the outer you, if I may say so. And then you are so willing to spend money on the outer you, not dealing with the inner person. So thank you so much for joining us. It's been such a, you know, such a great, like, conversation with you and uh, so real, so personal. And I know that my viewers have been able to experience a lot and to learn a lot. And I know that uh, we've not exhausted everything, but, you know, we really can't. So we're just going to have to wrap it up today and we'll be back next time. So thank you so, so much for having uh, taken your time. And uh, yeah, I look forward to another session with you and I wish you all the best. Thank you, my viewer, for being with us today. And uh, yeah, I wish you a lovely month of May and keep it healthy in all ways. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.